All right. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Museum of the Southern Jewish Experience. My name is Kenneth Hoffman. I am the executive director, and I am so pleased to have you here. And I am super pleased to have Peter Wolf here, who is going to talk about his new book, The Sugar King, Leon Gottschalk, a New Orleans legend, his Creole slave, and his Jewish roots. And we have these books for sale out in our museum store. And for you folks that are watching online, uh, we have them for sale in our online museum store too. So you should order one and it'll be delivered to you by Hanukkah and or Christmas. <laughs> um, we're gonna, Peter's gonna talk a little bit about his book. We're gonna have a conversation about it. And we're going to open it up to questions. If you're here with us in the museum, you just raise your hand. If you are watching via Zoom and you have a question, you can type it into the chat and we will, if we have time, we will get to it as well. Uh, and I would also like to um, uh, acknowledge that we have one of our board members here, Mr. Keith Katz. Keith, raise your hand in the back. So thank you, Keith, for all you've done for the museum. And now I'd like to uh, make a formal introduction of Peter M. Wolf, who is an award-winning author. His 2013 memoir, My New Orleans Gone Away, reached the New York Times bestseller list. Previous books, such as Land in America, Hot Towns, and The Future of the City have been honored by the National Endowment for the Arts, the Ford Foundation, and the Graham Foundation. Peter was educated at Metairie Park Country Day School, right here, Phillips Exeter Academy, Yale, never heard of it, <laughs> Tulane, heard of that, um, and New York University's Institute of Fine Arts. His research has taken him to Paris as a Fulbright scholar and to Rome as a visiting artist scholar at the American Academy in Rome. In New Orleans, Peter serves on the advisory board of the Tulane University School of Architecture and as a trustee of the Louisiana Landmark Society. In East Hampton, where he lives also a part of the year, he is a trustee of Guild Hall and the, Preser and the Village Preservation Society. Peter is a fifth generation New Orleans native and is Leon Gachaw's great, great grandson. Peter. Welcome. Thank you so much, Kenneth. Take it away. <laughs> well, I'm very happy to be here. Can you hear me in the back? Um, first thing I want to say is when you look at this, it looks kind of overwhelming. And I wanted to tell you that because I don't like being overwhelmed by big, heavy books, uh, I had it printed in 14 point type. So you can see it without your glasses on. <laughs> and uh, the other hints about this is that I had a uh, very extensive index put in it. So you can also look up subjects and not have to bother with reading what you don't uh, care about. And then, because I get confused when I read sort of historical books uh, with the timeline, this happened and that happened and this happened. I put a complete timeline in the back. So you can easily, when you're going through it, refer to that and see what else was happening at the same time. So it's, a, it's an ease of read effort on my part, having been a reader all my life. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say as a kind of introduction to it is that I got involved in this because Leon Gacho is somebody I had barely heard about as a child. My grandmother would tell me stories sitting on the porch in past Christian. And then later in life, I lived in the quarter. I lived on Burgundy Street. And I sort of found out that Leon Gacho, when he got well off and after the Civil War, lived on Esplanade Avenue. And that was about seven blocks away. So that began to interest me. But I really didn't get very interested in him until I wrote this uh, memoir that Ken referred to, because I had to figure out if I was going to write about myself a little bit, where did I come from? And then that led me to think about where did Leon come from? 
And I went on a whole tour of kind of cul-de-sac to Europe and Alsace-Lorraine where he grew up and then wondered why he ever got to Alsace-Lorraine. And I spent years looking into that and going all the way back into the Holy Roman Empire, et cetera. That's the next book, so don't worry about it. You don't have to deal with any of that at this point. Uh, what I did find out when I started to look into his life and who he was, as many of you probably know, he became extremely prominent. He was the most revered retailer, uh, clothing wholesaler and manufacturer. He was the largest sugar producer in the region, ended up with 14 plantations, three huge refineries, a very wealthy man, et cetera. But the magic is that this man was illiterate and he came from Lorraine, France, all by himself as a 12 year old. Broke, completely broke, unable to read or write, unable to speak English, of course. And he lands at the foot of Canal Street. He's 13 by then, he had his birthday after four months at sea. And he's all alone, he has nothing, he knows nothing. He had worked as a peddler in Europe to help his family before he got on the boat to come to New Orleans. His father had died when he was seven. His father had been the butcher in the village of Ebevie, where his family lived for several generations. I went over there to try to find out what kind of life he could have had there. I walked through the areas that he walked in as a peddler from village to village to see what it was like for him. The village was even smaller when I was there than when he grew up. It was about 350 people completely drab, 600 people when he was a child. So I began to get a feel for this man. And the more I looked into his life, the more I found out that as prominent as he was during his life, there was almost no information about him. And that of course intrigued me, but it also kind of dumbfounded me because how am I gonna find out anything? Should I just give up or not? Well, I started going to notary uh, offices in various parishes in the outlying parts of the area where he had owned property to see what I could find out about transactions. I looked into newspaper articles and so forth and so on. All there were were a few obituaries. Uh, very hard to find out information about him because he didn't write and he didn't have anything written about him. He was a very shy uh, introverted man. It's about my size, small, uh, had dashing blue eyes, which people remarked about. And then when I came to this wonderful museum right around the corner here, all about Southern Jewish heritage, here was this extremely prominent man. Some people think one of the two or three most prominent men of the late 19th century in New Orleans, Jewish. And there's nothing at all about him in the museum which gives you a clue, and it gave me one, about how difficult it was and is to find anything out about him. So this book is basically a primer and a history uh, that will, I think, introduce him, I hope, to the museum, uh, to the city and to the region and to the country. He deserves it. Some of the... Um, blurbs that you'll read in here by prominent writers and uh, citizens of New Orleans say that they think he was one of the most significant men of the 19th century in the region, uh, and yet we can find nothing about him. So I encourage you to take a look at this, even it's easier to deal with, as I told you. Uh, one hint, of, uh, I'm set, this is a sales pitch right now. Uh, the museum has, what, 40 copies? Maybe 40 a copies. A number of copies. <laughs> it, it, is, it is sold out uh, in the country. You can't get it on Amazon. Uh, the whole first printing is sold out. Luckily, Ken uh, bought some ahead of time or got some put in here. And uh, if you want a copy, this is the place to get it now. The second printing will probably take about two or three months, or two months anyway. There are about 75 pictures in it. Uh, I was going to bring a PowerPoint and show you pictures, and I decided let's talk about it. You can find the pictures here or on my website, uh, peterandwolf.com has all the 
photographs that are in this book, if you want to look at them. The book also has very extensive captions under the pictures. So one way to read this book is to look at pictures and read captions and just keep going. And you'll get the gist. Uh, I tried to make it easy because uh, it, it, it's just a nice thing for everybody. So that's the story um, that you have to imagine this child uh, with nothing ending up so prominent. Uh, he was even, um, this will only be a, a way of understanding prominence in New Orleans. He was a, the Duke of Rex uh, <laughs> in, about the, in the founding of Rex. Uh, he was one of those young men who got Rex together as an organization. And when you became a Duke of Rex in 1872, uh, you got to call yourself what kind of Duke you wanted to be. And of course, most of the Dukes called themselves the Duke of wherever they had come from, Shoppershire or uh, Paris or someplace like that. Uh, he called himself the Duke of Clothing. He was, <laughs> he was that modest. Uh, oh, and those are the doubloons. And much, much later, uh, a, a Mardi Gras organization many years later honored him as one of the great men of Louisiana and struck doubloons, which were his picture and a little sugar stock and his dates of birth and death. He was born in 1824. He dies in 1899. Can we? Uh, can you get us one of those to put on display? I would love to, but I can't. I haven't found one. <laughs> eBay. Yeah, if you, if you find two, get okay. it in. Seven um, that's a, a meager introduction to a series of fascinating, to me, fascinating stories because twined into Leon Gaccio's life, for instance, is the story of a Creole Black man. And all of his life, it was said that he, Joachim Tassin was the man's name. It, all of Leon Gaccio's life, it was said that Tassin had come on the ship with him had picked up the boat, maybe in Jamaica, maybe he was a laborer on the boat. They got off together, practically holding hands, these young boys, and pedaling, which is how Leon started his life here, pedaling up the Mississippi. We're gonna talk about him more, so I'm not gonna to say too much. Uh, and then worked with Leon Gacho in Convent, Louisiana, where he started a little store. And then when Gacho's got to New Orleans, on Levy, Old Levy Street, which is now Decatur. Uh, the Tessa was with him the whole way as a very light-skinned, uh, very smart uh, young man. Well, the truth is I found out is that in 1849, uh, Leon, I call him Leon as if I know him, but you know who I'm talking about. Leon and his brother, Meyer, took a carriage upriver to reserve. And at the dissolution of the Tassin plantation at an auction, uh, when the plantation was going under, Leon bought Joachim Tassin. He was a slave. He was named only Joachim at that point. As soon as they left town in the carriage, the two men agreed that they would keep Tassin's status as a slave forever a secret. That permitted this attractive, light-skinned black man to be a free person of color once he got to New Orleans, which gave him status way beyond any slave would ever have had. And Tassan did work with Leon the whole of his life, worked at Gachos, except when he went rogue uh, and started his own store after the Civil War and after he had been in Europe We'll probably talk about that too, so I'm not going to go into it. But they were dedicated to one another, and Tassin's slave status was never revealed in either of their lives. They kept the secret to their death. Tassin was a pallbearer during the Jim Crow period of Leon Gacho. So you can imagine the stir that caused when he shows up as a pallbearer. So there are many other stories within this biography. There are things about the uh, terrible convict leasing uh, operations that went on in the state of Louisiana. 
that I've never known anything about and may interest you. A story, a lot about the evolution of the sugar business and the Gacho's scientific inquiries that made him, propelled him into a really premier producer of sugar because he used modern technology that nobody else had used. That was also with the help of leveraging off of an invention of a black man named Norbert Rieu, an evaporation process that Rieu patented and then couldn't get the second patent for in disgust. He went back to Europe, buried in, in Paris. But Gacho figured out how to use the information, the scientific information. And that was another trait of his. He could, he was so smart, he could see things that were interesting and convert them to usefulness for himself and for his businesses. But I'm going to stop there and let Ken do grill me or whatever he's going to do. I have no idea. Okay. This is not a setup at all. <laughs> well, first of all, uh, everything that Peter has said so far about the book is true. It's uh, it's a, it's easy to read. The print is large enough for me to read, which is great. Um, wonderful photographs um, and etchings and such uh, with wonderful captions. So it's eminently readable. Um, not only is it a biography of a man it is a picture of, of a time period, several time periods, um, the culture, the economy, the, um, the politics of these various time periods throughout his life here in New Orleans and, and beyond. So I encourage you to read it if that's the kind of thing you're into. Um, first question, for a man who didn't uh, read or write, and and I'd like to find out if that is a 100% like idea that uh, he, he was truly illiterate or you just su suspect it. How did you wind up? What were your sources for most of this book? Well, the first part of your question, his one of his grandchildren knew him, who was a writer herself, uh, Elma Gacho, who you may have heard about. She was a prominent writer. She testified, she, I shouldn't say testified, she said, uh, and she knew Leon, and she was very literate, that he could neither read nor write. Uh, in all the documents that I went through, and there were many contracts of different kinds, uh, I searched for his signature. And his signature was absolutely inconsistent. It was the signature of a child, big sort of loopy things. And often in those days, the notaries wrote up by hand, of course, the contracts. The sign his signature usually was written by the notary. It was in the same ink, the same style and so forth. And there's a testament in the deal that says Leon Gacho is here and present. And then his name is signed by the notary. That was all through his life. So I'm pretty sure that he couldn't read or write. Now, he married uh, a 16-year-old seamstress who was working on St. Anne Street, who was the daughter of school teachers who also were from Lorraine, France. So he found somebody that he could understand very well. She was extremely literate. Justine read and write. And she knew history a bit. She was educated. So she was a help to him. But also, he was very intuitive as a young man when he was able to finally hire some people to work with him in New Orleans when he opened his store on Levy, oh, Levy Street. He hired three or four people who were university graduates uh, from Berlin University, his clerk, and another person who became his sort of chief accountant who could read Greek and Latin. So he had people around him. He knew he had to surround himself by people who could help. And you and you suspect, or you mentioned that uh, perhaps he may have had a learning disability or been dyslexic, uh, because in 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 Jewish tradition, you know, the people of the book, reading, writing, is right. very education is very important. Of course, he left his family when he was very young, so he didn't have that sort of uh, prompting. But um, 
But then later, when he did have an opportunity to possibly learn to read or write, it appears that he didn't. It appears that he didn't. And um, it sort of begins to touch on something about his Jewishness, because he, he came to New Orleans in 1837 when there were only about 1,000 to 2,000 Jews in the city. And everybody who was here at the time was pretty much Orthodox because they had come from Europe. He was probably Orthodox or his family was, but he really didn't have any interest in Orthodox Judaism. He didn't get involved in the sort of Jewish movement, if you will, until Reform Judaism came to New Orleans from Charleston in the 1870s. And he supported Jewish causes. He was socially Jewish. He never tried to be anything else, but he, he didn't think of himself as a man of the book or a person of the book uh, at all. He, his stores were stores that, had, that, that were um, geared to serve ordinary people uh, and at eventually at a very high level of conventional Western American <clears throat> Southern clothing. Well, tell me, um, here in the museum, we, we talk a lot about the tension between acceptance and, um, you know, and um, persecution or anti-Semitism. Um, and a lot of people are surprised when they go through our museum, and it's not all about anti-Semitism and the KKK. And, um, and there are many stories, there are more stories of acceptance and contributions by Jews to their Southern communities. Um, what about Leon Gacho um, and anti-Semitism throughout his life? Well, I, I, I found nothing that was overtly anti-Semitic that he encountered. Uh, I pointed, I mentioned Rex as an mm -hmm. example of the opposite. Um, his stores, as far as I could tell, were never infringed upon. And he was never in any way maligned uh, because of his race, or his religion. Uh, Anti-Semitism in New Orleans, as far as I can piece it together, uh, doesn't really start until there is a volume of Jews, eight, seven thousand, five thousand, six thousand, seven thousand. In the early days, when Jews were very rare here, there was, as far as I can tell, not, no anti-Semitic incidents. Even he supported. He was involved in the beginnings of Temple Sinai when it was first built in the eighteen seventies. He was a. He and his wife were very firm supporters. What, what was known at the time of, as the uh, Widows and Orphans Home. Uh, later, it became only known as the Orphans Home. Newman? Uh, well, and that was the school that was started for the Orphans. Newman gets started, well, just that, that building eventually, uh, the first building ends up at the corner of St. Charles and Jefferson. It's now where the Jewish Community Center is. And the, the Widows and Orphans Home uh, had kind of as a spinoff that Isidore Newman started a school where the orphan, and he was pleased about this, where the orphans could go to school with well-off um, family-based children. And that's what, how Newman started. Um, so yes, he was involved in that. He was very involved in a part of the, uh, Metairie Cemetery, which had been a racetrack. Uh, you probably all know that, but in the 1870s, the racetrack folded and it became a for sale and the territory was uh, purchased and a small section of it was converted to sort of the Jewish area of the cemetery. And you can still go there and see the early families names well and it the was place. the and it was the the high class cemetery the the jewish cemetery was across the street um and uh, really it was i think it was it, it was gutim i think it was rabbi gutim when he died they they wanted him to be buried in this sort of up more upper class so they consecrated a part of yeah. metairie cemetery 
as a Jewish cemetery, and, and mm -hmm. Isaac Delgado is buried there, and Edith Stern is buried there. I don't think it was ever called a Jewish cemetery. It just was yeah. an area that happened Correct. to have a lot of Jewish people Correct. buried there. Exactly. Uh, but he was a fervent uh, believer in Jewish causes, and he was uh, extremely generous to them. And Turo, which of course has its origin with uh, Judah P. Turo, uh, was something that interested him a lot because part of the problems there were not enough room and expansion and needing money. And after he died, there was a big expansion program at Turo uh, to start a new part of the building facing Britannia Street. And the uh, trustees, I guess they would be called of Turo, had underestimated the cost to, do, to complete the building. And so there was a panic. The ground had been broken, but they didn't have the money to do it. And uh, there was a plea generally set out. And his family, Charles Gacho, his, his executor, and the children, he had 10 children, um, all agreed to give a big grant to Turo in his name on his birthday of $50,000, which at the time was about a million and a half now. Uh, and the entrance pavilion on Britannia Street, not the one you see now, but the one built with their money, uh, was called the Leon Gacho Pavilion. And that's what you went through to get into Turo Hospital. Uh, it, of course, got absorbed with the later de redevelopment of the hospital. But he was very, they were, the family was committed to Jewish causes. So let me ask you this. Uh, we could talk about uh, Leon's business um, successes all night long, but would you, would you give us a few examples of how creative and, um, and economically <laughs> astute he was throughout his life. I'm thinking about him preparing for the Civil War ahead of time, yeah. going to New York, setting up a, a manufacturing, a clothing manufacturing so that he's his own supplier, things like that. Right. What, what are some other examples? Sure. Well, uh, that's a great one. When he went to New York, not just to set up a, a business, uh, which was very smart too, and he was producing uh, clothing that he could sell in New Orleans in the stores. But he also went to New York to get rid of his Confederate currency and to get rid of what he understood or believed would become valueless uh, resource. And he converted almost all of his money, everything that he could spare, which by then was quite a bit, to gold and silver deposited in, in New York. So he would get out of the spiral of the Confederacy and out of what he, I'm sure, imagined was going to be a disaster. Uh, but in New York, he saw that manufacturing was going on of clothing. There had been no manufacturing in New Orleans prior to the Civil War, for whatever reason. And I don't know why, because in St. Louis there was, and up and down the river, clothing was being put another here. But when he learned that New Orleans was going to surrender, and that was not going to be devastated in the Civil War. And he had resources here and information. Uh, he brought his family home back to New Orleans just before the river closed, just before the port closed to civilians. And he, the only thing he brought with him, other than their clothing, was a sewing machine. And he started manufacturing clothing with the sewing machine. He found out, he realized, but he saw what was happening in New York. So that's one example. Uh, another example is that when the war was start, was impending, before it got started, he noticed that country merchants were coming into the city and buying great quantities of clothing from him, from his stores, because they were afraid there would be no more merchandise if the war started and the city was destroyed or whatever. So at that point, he started to be a wholesaler, not just to retail clothing, but he changed the nature of his business, he expanded the nature of his business from just retail to wholesale so that he could satisfy the demands in the countryside. Uh, and then of course, as I said, the third, the third 
leg of the stool is when he became also a manufacturer after the Civil War. So that's a little bit in the in the clothing business. He also did brilliant advertising. I have some advertising um, reproduced in the book. It's very charming, very personal, uh, very casual. And uh, I think he was good at, at marketing. I mean, he dictated to somebody to write these things out. Uh, in the sugar business, some of the conversions that he did, as I mentioned, this um, evaporator that no, uh, wrote, uh, had been invented by the black man who went back to France um, had been languishing. Nobody had used it. Somebody had tried one or two uh, experiments with it uh, south of New Orleans downriver. But Leon Gacho figured out that that was really a valuable thing because you could refine sugar using much less fuel if it was done in an eva in a evaporation chamber. You could, as, as opposed to open kettles. Which as opposed to a series, it was refined by a series of open kettles. Dangerous thing. <laughs> dangerous, people got hurt. It was very hot stuff being by hand moved back and forth. So he saved an enormous amount of uh, fuel and more efficiently produced sugar. The other thing he did is in the sugar business is he noticed that rail, railroads came very late to the South, uh, but he noticed that the major railroads that did come down the river uh, hauled things very much easier than uh, mules and men. So he had the idea of ordering from the Baldwin Company, which was the, the best manufacturer of railroads at the time, engines and cars, he ordered a miniature series, a three-quarter scale series of engines and cars that he then put on his plantations. And they hauled the cane in from the fields into the, uh, into the refineries. That saved a lot of labor. Uh, I should say, because you may be, that may be going through your mind right now about saving labor. He didn't get into the sugar business. He refused to get into the sugar business until the Civil War was over. He'd wanted no part of running plantations for profit with slaves. And the various people that came to him and tried to interest him in plantation life and agriculture before the Civil War were turned down. But after the Civil War, he got very involved in it. Not really on purpose. Somebody came to him and said, can you help me out? And he lent him a lot of money and then they still couldn't pay it and he lent him some more and he tried to make the terms easier. Ultimately, the owner of Reserve Plantation, the Botescu family, Sophie Botescu, came to him and said, I just can't make a go of it. She had no workers, she had no capital. And he bought the plantation from her very generously. He gave her the right to live on it for her whole life. Uh, at no cost at all, et cetera. So that's how he got into the sugar business. So besides the evaporator and the railroads, he did one other ma major thing to change the sugar industry forever. He consolidated the manufacturing aspects of sugar into pods, into three major pods. And he got rid of all the other manufacturing on each plantation and just use the railroad system to bring in the cane to the manufacturing spot. So that consolidated and got rid of all the excess that was unnecessary in the production of sugar. And then he had three really massive refineries that had modern equipment, and that's what made him the sugar king. He was known as the sugar king in his lifetime. So um, you mentioned not wanting to run a plantation with enslaved labor uh, yet. Um, if I'm remembering correctly, he purchased at least three people, um, uh, Joachim being one of them, and two, uh, I can't exactly remember, but I think two housekeepers. Yes. Uh, uh, so tell me, let's talk a little bit about um, the South race, Leon, and and what you imagine his thinking was on or what you found his thinking was on race and, and how that how that played out right um, 
<clears throat> it's clear to me that he was not a fan of slavery at all. He had actually come from a disadvantaged population. He had seen Jews and known the story of Jews in Europe as a child. Uh, he did nothing that I can find to actually exploit slavery when he had plenty of opportunity to do so. On the other hand, when his life was developing with his wife and they were beginning to have children and he was working full time and she was just a young girl, they needed household help. And if you were in New Orleans in 1850 and you needed household help, you didn't call the help wanting agency or look in the paper for uh, one ads. You had to have somebody that you bought or that was a slave. That's what was available. What he did that I think is a kind of, and I don't blame him for that at all, uh, what he did, there's a mitigating factor, is he never went to one of these slave pens or slave auctions. New Orleans was full of, it was one of the most robust slave markets in all of the country after it became illegal to import slaves from abroad. It was a huge slave town for selling because of all the agriculture around here and also all the other industry. What he did is he arranged through notaries to quietly buy the two or three people that over the course of his being a father of 10 children that he needed for household help. And as far as I can tell, paid them, uh, treated, there was no mistreatment. And in fact, I believe because he was so frugal that he lived in his little apartment above the store until after the Civil War when he had a lot of children, I believe his help lived off site. They weren't in some terrible, he paid them well enough to live off site. And he, um, he actually, before the war, uh, sold the last slave woman and her two children that he had uh, before he went to New York. He took somebody to New York with him who was a help, a helper, a help, help person. And I couldn't find out exactly who that was, but it may have been another slave that I haven't been able to identify. He had identifiably two different female slaves, one that worked for the family for many years, uh, named Francoise, and another younger woman who stayed with the Gacho group for about three years. Um, so he he participated in it for sure, but never for profit, not in his stores and not in his plantations, never exploited slavery to make a profit, which is the only distinguishing characteristic when you get into this subtle area that I. Well, know. and in the title of your book, the, 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 the subtitle, Leon Gacho, a New Orleans legend, his Creole slave and his Jewish roots. And you spend a good amount of time in this book talking about Joachim and Tassin. So tell us a little bit about what you found out, what you what you were surprised at, and and why he why he um, commands a, a large portion of this book. Well, he's he's a, a fascinating guy. As I said, he was a slave boy on the Tassin plantation, uh, which went bankrupt and was purchased by Leon. But he was educated because his father had been, the head of the plantation had been Senor Tassin. And he uh, was also very light skinned. He could read, he could write, he could speak at least two languages. And when he was purchased and brought to New Orleans, Gacho already had a going enterprise and Tassin proved very, very capable a very good worker, but also he became a skilled uh, tailor. He became thought of as the most skilled tailor in New Orleans. People brought their kids to be fitted only by Tassin. Uh, along the way, now he's disguised all this time as a free person of color, which gave him freedom to roam the city and 
be enterprising and socially prominent in this black community, the free person of color community. I don't know if any of you have been to the FPC Museum, which is very interesting on Esplanade. It's all about the free person of color co uh, community. And so he became, he became a, a very sought after person, well paid, and he was consulted about business decisions and so forth. Uh, he marries a black woman who's a free person of color and they live quite well he's, as a couple. Uh, she dies and he's alone for a time. He lived in the French Quarter most of the, his life until, until she died. Then he moved out to North Roman Street. And at that point, he's still a free person of color. He's got a very good job. He is beginning to be kind of exploring about what he wanted to do, how he wants to change his life. He asks Leon Gacho for a leave of absence. Uh, he spends six months in Europe uh, going around. And in Europe, of course, he's much more easily accepted and respected than he was be in the South or in New Orleans. And he comes back and he decides, well, I'm going to open a store. I'm going to try to do this on my own. You know, things are pretty good. It was during Reconstruction. He opens a store and, and here's where it gets really revelatory about him. He marries a white woman from Bordeaux, a French white woman. And that's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> it's really complicated because when they fill out various forms, uh, and their questions asked, for instance, if he wanted a passport or any kind of financial documents, uh, he begins to conceal his history and hers. Sometimes they're married, sometimes they aren't depending on whether it's a local document or a federal document. Uh, at one point, she owns the house and he's just a tenant. Uh, at another point, uh, he's from Jamaica and she's, of course, from France living in New Orleans. Another time, he's from Mexico. They're working with the laws as the time goes on to try not to get in trouble. And I've, I've charted that. and given you information about the laws that they're evading and working around as a black and white person living together. Of course, by then he's not a slave, he's, the war's over. Uh, so that's a sidelight of Tessin. He does, uh, when he's an older man, he begins to accumulate property himself in his neighborhood and he, in, his, in his will, uh, when he dies, he owns seven or eight, five or six quite good properties right in the North Roman neighborhood that he managed. He continues to work at the store after Leon dies and is utterly respected. And as I said, he ends up being a pallbearer for his for Leon Gaccio. Uh, so he's a he's an emblem of what a thoughtful, smart black man had to do, had to go through to navigate the culture, the economy, and the laws that they were beset with from slavery. He starts out in slavery, in Reconstruction, the Civil War itself. Oh, in the Civil War, he joins a militia to defend New Orleans, a Black militia to defend New Orleans, because what if the South won? You know, that would change his, the way he was thought of. Uh, and as soon as it's clear that the South, that New Orleans is not going to even put up a fight, he's told, go home, get your uniform off and go back to work <laughs> to protect yourself. Uh, so it's a complicated story. And he stands for uh, what Black people had to do even after slavery to get along well in this area. Well, we want to have time for questions, but so I have one more question for you, and then we'll open it up, which is, tell us, where is the Gacho family today? Where, where, where are the descendants, and where's the money? 
Follow the money. I mean, this 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 museum still needs a named uh, <laughs> and a sponsor there. So. Well, I have some bad news for you. <laughs> uh, the the Theon Gacho's great fortune, and he did create in not just good deeds and charitable contributions, but he created a legitimate fortune, uh, something like two hundred million dollars is the estimate and I've been through his will and tried to convert it and everything. Unfortunately, he had, well, fortunately he had very responsible children. He had 10 children. It took seven of them to run his businesses mm -hmm. and his three daughters married well in New Orleans and all that was fine. But you get to the next generation, the third generation, and you know what they say, shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves. They were not so great. Uh, the, the lands, the 14 plantations, almost 100,000 acres, were sold in a stupid transaction to William Zeckendorf, whom you probably all heard of, who was a great real estate entrepreneur. His web and nap company uh, was involved with the Chrysler Building in New York and the UN and many, many other real big time real estate transactions. When the sugar company was being run by his grandchildren and his grandchildren's generation, they basically blew it with a very bad deal with Zeckendorf. After that deal, it went through four or five other owners. What Zeckendorf wanted was the land and he spun it off and developed many other things with it, some of it Cancer Alley. Uh, the sugar company, the operating sugar company, went through five or six iterations and owners before it finally closed. Uh, what's left up there at Reserve is a, quite a nice Creole, raised Creole house that we've been working on trying to restore. That's the only remnant of Leon Gacho's agricultural empire that exists. The Gobaplex port up there is all on his land. So that was lost in very bad transaction. And then the store went bankrupt, again, under the tutelage of his grandchildren um, by not being wise about merging and repurposing re re the stores and so forth. So as far as endowing the museum, it's not that So you're happen. saying it's up to the people in this room. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, oh, well. and, and the family spread. There used to be around 100 people named Gacho in New Orleans. The family is spread all over the country and in Europe. Um, there are only one person left in New Orleans, two, with, with the last name Gacho. It's a, a man, Alan Gacho, some of you may know, and his daughter. That's it. Uh, there are descendants, of course, but not the Gacho name. I mean, I'm a descendant, yeah. but not the Gacho name. All right. Well, um, this is just a taste of the stories and the history in this book. Um, so what questions are there from the crowd here or online? Right up front. I, and, and shout it out. Okay. Okay. Um, what do you know of his life before age 12? Well, a little bit. Um, I went When I went to Ebra VA, I thought I would be able to find somebody who knew something about the family. I know that he was a peddler from the age of about seven or eight. Uh, they would just get scraps of things and he would walk to villages nearby. Uh, it's a very rural agricultural land with sort of low hills and cattle. And, so forth. I know that they had in their house, next to their house, or almost incorporated in where he lived, the animal pens, uh, like for sheep or cattle or whatever they had as animals. Uh, it was sort of just together. They didn't have any land. They didn't own any property where they could put their animals. I know that his father was a butcher and that his grandfather had been the butcher in the village. He had five siblings. One Meyer came and worked with him for, in New Orleans for until right after the Civil War, till 1866. One of his brothers came here briefly 
uh, Mazar and left to go venture into the gold mines, the gold rush in California. He didn't make it in, in, in gold, but he became a, a rancher and developed a family in California. Um, I don't know much else. I know that there were other spellings of his name. His name, by the way, in Europe was Lion, G-O-D-C-H-O-T. He creolized it when he got to New Orleans, he was advised to. Um, there are other iterations of that name that I've been able to trace back into the 18th century, but I'm not sure they're the same stem as his, his family. Other questions? Uh, yes, sir. Peter, two questions. One, uh, the Baton Rouge guy shows that you in it. Is that a relation? Though? I don't think so. It okay. is not. Yeah. And, am I wrong then? I thought the plant, the, the Gacho sugar plantation in reserve survived, in fact, still exists. Is that not correct? Uh, it depends. What is, does still exist? No. There's no. There's no manufacturing going on there. It survived after Zeckendorf, the Zeckendorf deal, uh, when he he spun off the plantation, the uh, refinery businesses to various different companies. I mean, started with one company and another and another, and finally it was Gulf South, which you may know about, and it was Henderson for a while. But none of it, ultimately refining sugar on that at that place completely stopped. So there's none. There's just the house, uh, which is still there, and it had been moved onto the near the refinery. It's back along the river now. Uh, it's on right at the corner of 10th Street and River Road, and it's being restored. So, so but I will mention this about Gotcha's in Baton Rouge with the U, and it's they're not related, but their um, their motto or their tagline was the difference is you. <laughs> and, and they had to say that because of the prominence of Gotcha's here in New Orleans. So that this were a different thing than that. So that speaks to the prominence of gachos here in New Orleans. How is the battery spelled? Uh, with a U, G-O-U-D. Oh, G-O-U-D. Yeah. So, so we have a question here, and then we'll come here. Yeah, two, two quick questions. Don, when, when did uh, his family get to Alsace Lorraine? And then also, was it poverty that triggered his immigration to Ethiopia? Well, the second is yes. It was definitely poverty. And obviously he was somewhat ambitious, even as a little boy, because he could have, like many children in Ebervilliers and in Lorraine, stay. And of course, had he stayed, as many uh, people in that community did, they were, he would have been wiped out in the Second World War. He would have been exterminated and his family wouldn't exist. Uh, what was your first question? Oh, uh, when did his family get to Alsace? Well, I, I, tr I, I went, I, I tried as hard as I could to find that out. Uh, I know that they were there for at least two generations before him. Uh, and then I started tracing the Jewish movement into Alsace-Lorraine as best I could and trying to hold on to the name. <clears throat> and it turns out, as probably some of you know, many of you know, the reason there was such a big Jewish community in Alsace-Lorraine is that the Jews had been thrown out of England in the 13th and 14th century and thrown out of France. We think of Alsace-Lorraine as France, but at the time it wasn't. It was the very Western edge of the Holy Roman Empire. And the Holy Western edge is like what we think of as the far West. It wasn't very well managed. And so Jews were kind of accumulating there because they could get out of the way of everybody who was persecuting them. And so they kept, they came in there over many, many centuries. I traced the, the sort of Jewish movement that I think he was part of, this is gonna surprise you, it surprised me, to Sardinia. And I think that there was a move uh, in 1492 when the Jews had to leave all, all everything that had to do with Spain. I think that's when his, group came and moved towards France or towards Alsace Lorraine going up the Loire River. That's what I think, but I can't prove that. That's the next book. Says, so. <laughs> All right, uh, right over here. Yeah. You know, I'm trying to pattern how a boy 
could depart from Europe with no pay mm -hmm. and somehow get to America? Did his family pay his way? Was he some sort of indentured servant? Was he, I mean, how did you do that? <laughs> when you're it, a boy. I know. And, and get from point A to point B. Did, when, did you get the insight? When, when we think of children that we know, mm -hmm. or ourselves as children in our time, it's inconceivable that one of our 12 year olds <laughs> could even find his way to the corner store. You know? <laughs> so the, the, but they could set up our cable boxes. <laughs> <laughs> the route was a carriage to Paris and he stayed in Paris a day or two to get another carriage to La Havre. And we know the ship he was on in from La Havre was called the Indus. He was on the man of, he was in La Havre. He had a little bit of money that his mother had helped him with and from his peddling, but very little. And he, it's described that he had a pack on his back of just very, subs the most fundamental basic clothing. And that he got on the ship, he had enough money to get on the ship. There were, at the time, ship brokers working in Alsace-Lorraine, selling very cheap tickets to New Orleans uh, because it was French speaking, New Orleans was. Mm -hmm. And there was a, uh, obviously enough uh, transport going back and forth that they wanted to get some passengers below deck. And so it was cheap, but he still had to have enough money to do it. He was not a servant. He was a lone boy four months on that ship, uh, making his own food and just surviving. And I, I can't tell you anything more than that about it. It's a miracle. But to think that he did this and what he ended up accomplishing is you know, a huge story, which I've tried to tell. All right, we have time for one more and I see a hand in the back, so a short question. How long did it take you to compile all of this information to put this book? It was about two weeks, six, right? six or seven years. Yeah. <laughs> six or seven years. And uh, a lot of it fruitless, you know, looking, looking. Uh, any of you know Robert Carroll, probably know his writing, his brilliant uh, biographer. He wrote a little book about his process of working. And one of the lines, I mean, I, I read that book long after I was finished, but. <laughs> Uh, it struck me as the line. He says, turn every page. And that's what I had to do to try to find as much as I could. Fantastic. Y'all, uh, this has been wonderful. Peter, thank, thank you. you so much. This is the book. I want everyone to sit right here, folks that are online. Um, I want you to know that the book is available if you go to our website, msje.org. And all you have to do is click click the shop button and you can buy this book. You can buy all the good Hanukkah merch. Um, I uh, for, for folks who are shopping at our store for this book and anything else, for the entire month of December, 15, what is it? <laughs> no, members, museum members, 20% off everything in the store. And for those who aren't members, we're spinning the dreidel for discounts. So we have a spin to win. So feel free to shop. But Peter is going to be sitting out front. He's got a pen, or we're going to give him a pen. I've got one. Uh, he's got one. He's got his own pen. I, I, I like a man who's totally got his own pen. Um, and he's going to sign books for you. Um, and so, and this program will be on our YouTube channel within the coming days. We're going to we're going to edit me out. I hope. Um, and keep Peter in. Um, and I, again, want to thank everyone for being here and uh, say that we hope you come back and visit the museum during the day when we're open. Uh, and thank you so much. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you.